The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, Chapter 12, What I Saw of the Destruction of Weybridge and Shepperton. As the dawn grew brighter, we withdrew from the window from which we had watched the Martians and went very quietly downstairs. The artillery man agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in. He proposed, he said, to make his way Londonward, and then rejoice, join his battery, number 12 of the house artillery. My plan was to return at once to Leatherhead, and so greatly had the strength of the Martians impressed me that I had determined to take my wife to New Haven and go with her out of the country forthwith, for I already perceived clearly that the country about London must inevitably be the scene of a disastrous struggle before such creatures as these would be destroyed. Between us and Leatherhead, however, lay the third cylinder, with its guarding giants. Had I been alone, I think I should have taken my chance and struck across country. But the artillery man dissuaded me. It's no kindness to the right sort of wife, he said, to make her a widow. And in the end, if I agreed to go with him under the cover of the woods, northward, what, as far as the street of Choham before I parted with him, thence I would make a big detour by Epson to reach Leatherhead. I should have started at once, but my companion had been in active service, and he knew better than that. He made me ransack the house for a flask, which he filled with whiskey, and he lined every available pocket with packets of biscuits and slices of meat. Then we crept out of the house, and ran as quickly as we could down the ill-made road by which I had come overnight. The houses seemed deserted, and in the road lay a group of three charred bodies close together, struck dead by the heat ray, and here and there were things that people had dropped, a clock, a slipper, a silver spoon, and little poor valuables. At the corner, turning up toward the post office, a little cart filled with boxes and furniture, and horseless, heeled over on a broken heat wheel. A cash box had been hastily smashed open and thrown over and under debris. Except for the lodge at the orphanage, which was still on fire, none of the houses had suffered very greatly here. The heat ray had shaved the chimney tops and passed. Yet, save ourselves, there did not seem to be a living soul on Mayberry Hill. The majority of the inhabitants had escaped, I suppose, by way of the old Woking Road, uh, the road I had taken when I drove to Leatherhead, or else they had hidden. We went down the lane, by the body of the man in the black, sodden now from the overnight hail, we broke into the woods at the foot of the hill. We pushed through these toward the railway, without meeting a soul. The woods across the line were but scarred and blackened ruins of woods. For the most part, the trees had fallen, but a certain proportion still stood, dismal gray stems with dark brown foliage instead of green. On our side, the fire had done no more than scorch the narrow trees. It had failed to secure its footing. In one place, the woodsmen had been sent to work on Saturday. Trees had been felled and freshly trimmed, and they lay in a clearing with heaps of sawdust by the sawing machine and its engine. Hard by was a temporary hut deserted. There was not a breath of wind this morning, and everything was strangely still. Even the birds were hushed, and as we hurried along, I and the artillery men talked in whispers and looked now and again over our shoulders. Once or twice we even stopped to listen. After a time we drew near the road, and as we did so we heard the clatter of hooves and saw through the tree stems three cavalry soldiers riding slowly toward Woking. We hailed them, and they halted while we hurried toward them. It was a lieutenant and a couple of privates of the 8th her Hussars, with a stand like a theodite, with the artillery man had told me it was a heliograph. "'You are the first men I've seen coming this way, this morning,' said the lieutenant. "'What's brewing?' His voice and face were eager. The men behind him stared curiously. The artillery man jumped down the bank to the road and saluted. "'Gun destroyed last night, sir. I've been hiding, trying to rejoin the battery, sir. You'll come in sight of the Martians, I expect, half a mile along this road.' "'What the dickens are they like?' asked the lieutenant. "'Giants in armor, sir. Hundred feet high, three legs, and a body like Luminimian. A mighty gray head in a hood, sir.' "'Get out!' said the lieutenant. "'What confounded nonsense!' "'You'll see, sir. They carry a kind of boxer that shoots fire and strikes you dead.' "'What do you mean? A gun?' "'No, sir.' The artilleryman began a vivid account of the heat ray. Halfway through, the lieutenant interrupted him and looked up at me. I was still standing on the bank by the side of the road. "'It's perfectly true,' I said. "'Well,' said the lieutenant, "'I suppose it's my business to see it, too. "'Look here,' to the artillery man. "'We're detailed here, clearing people out of their houses. "'You'd better go along and report yourself to Brigander General Marvin "'and tell him all you know. "'He's at the Waybridge. Know the way?' "'I do,' I said. 
and I turned his horse southward again. Half a mile, you say, said he. At most, I answered, and pointed over the treetop southward. He thanked me and rode on, and we saw them no more. Further along, we came upon a group of three women and two children in the road, busy chatting about a laborer's cottage. They had got a hold of a little hand truck and were pulling it up the unclean-looking bundles and shabby furniture. They were all too assiduously engaged to talk to us as we passed. By, by Fleet Station, we emerged with the pine trees and found the country calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. Here we were far from the range of the heat ray, and there had not been for the silent desertion of some of the houses, the stirring movement of packing and others, and the nod of soldiers, standing on the bridge over the railway, staring down at the line toward Woking, the day would seem very much like any other Sunday. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road to Addlestone, and suddenly through the gate of a field we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six twelve-pounders, standing neatly at equal distances, pointing toward Woking. The gunners stood by the guns waiting, and the ammunition wagons were all business-like distance. The men stood almost as if in under inspection. "'That's good,' said I. "'They'll get one fair shot at rate.' The artillery man hesitated at the gate. "'I shall go on,' he said. Further on, toward Weybridge, just over the bridge, there was a no were a number of men in white fatigue jackets throwing a large rampart and more guns behind. "'It's bows and arrows against the lightning!' Anyhow, said the artilleryman, they haven't seen the fire beam yet. The officers, who were not actively engaged, stood and stared over the treetops southward, and the men digging would stop every now and again to stare in the same direction. Byfleet was in a tumult. People packing in a score of hussars, some of them dismounted, some on horseback were hustling them about. Three or four black government wagons, with crosses and white circles and old om omnibus among other vehicles was being loaded in the village street there were scores of people most of them sufficiently sabbatical to have assumed their best clothes the soldiers were having the great difficulty in making them realize the gravity of their position we saw one shriveled old fellow with a huge box and a score or more of flower pots containing orchids angrily expoliating with the corporal who would have him leave them behind i stopped and gripped his arm do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine tops that hid the Martians. Eh, he said, turning. I was explaining these here are valuable. Death, I shouted. Death is coming. Death. And leaving him to digest that if he could, I hurried on after the artilleryman. At the corner, I looked back. The soldier had left him, and he was still standing by his box with the pots of orchids on the lit, lid of it and staring vaguely over the treetops. No one in Weybridge could tell us where the headquarters were established. The whole place was in such confusion as I had never seen in any town before. Carts, carriages everywhere, the most astonishing miscellany of conveyances and horseflesh. The respectable inhabitants of the place, men in golf and boating costumes, wives prettily dressed, were packing riverside loafers, energetically helping children excited, and for the most part highly delighted at the astonishing variation of Sunday experiences. In the midst of it all, the worthy vicar was plucking, pluckily holding an early celebration, and his bell was jangling out above the excitement. I and the artillerymen, seated on t the step of the drinking fountain, had made a very passable meal upon what we had brought to it with us. Patrols of soldiers, here no longer hussars, but grenadiers in white, were warning people to move now or take refuge, refuge in cellars as soon as the firing began. We saw as we crossed the railway bridge that a growing crowd of people had assembled in and about the railway station, and the swarming platform was piled with boxes and packages. The ordinary traffic had been stopped, I believe, in order to allow the passage of troops and guns to Chertsey, and I have heard since that a savage struggle occurred for places in the special trains that were put on at a later hour. We remained at Waitbridge until midday, and at that hour we found ourselves at the place near Shepperton Rock, where... The way and Thames join part of me. Part of the time we spent helping two old women to pack a little cart. The way has a troubled mouth, and at this point boats are to be hired, and there was a ferry across the river. On the Shepherdon side was an inn with a lawn, and beyond the tower of Shepherdon Church, that has been replaced by a spire, rose above the trees. Here we found an excited, noisy crowd of fugitives. As yet, the flight had not grown to a panic, but there were already far more people than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. 
People came panting along under heavy burdens. One husband and wife came even carrying a small outdoor, outhouse door between them, with some of their household goods piled thereupon. One man told us that he meant to try to get away from Shepperton Station. There were, was a lot of shouting, and one man was even jesting. The idea people seemed to have here was that the Martians were simply formidable human beings, who might attack and sack the town to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then people would glance nervously across the way at the meadows toward Chet's Chertsey, but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet in vivid contrast with the Surrey side. The people who had landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, star staring and jesting at the fugitives without offering to help. The inn was closed, as it was now within prohibited hours. "'What's that?' cried a boatman. "'And shut up, you fool!' said a man near me to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again, this time from the direction of Chertsey. A muffled thud. The sound of a gun." The fighting was beginning. Almost immediately, unseen batteries across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after another. A woman screamed. Everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle, near us and yet invisible to us. Nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pulled willows point motionlessly, motionless, motionless in the warm sunlight. The sojourners will stop them said a woman beside me, doubtfully. A haziness drew, rose over the treetops. Then suddenly we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river, a puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung, and forthwith the ground heaved underfoot, and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. "'Here they are!' shouted a man in a blue jersey. "'Yonder! Do you see them? Yonder!' Quickly, one and the other, one, two, three, four of the armored Martians appeared far away over the little trees across the flat meadows that stretched toward Chertsey and striding hurriedly toward the river. Little cowed figures they seemed at first going with the rolling motion and as fast as a flying bird. Then, advancing obliquely toward us, came a fifth. Their armored bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns, growing rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest, that is, flourished with a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat ray that I had already seen on Friday night smote toward Chertsey, and it struck down on the town. At the sight of these strange, swift, and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be for a moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence, then a hoarse murmur, and then the movement of feet, a splashing from the water, a man, too frightened to drop the promontory he had carried on his shoulder, swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. A woman thrust me with her hand and pushed past me. I turned with the rush of people, but I was not too terrified for thought. The terrible heat ray was in my mind to get underwater. That was it. Get underwater, I shouted unheeded. I faced about again and rushed toward the approaching Martian, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery and the river was so low that I ran perhaps 20 feet, scarcely waist deep. Then, as the Martian tur towered overhead, scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were lashing ha hastily on both sides of the river. But the Martian machine took no more notice for the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot had kicked. When half suffocated, I raised my head above water. The Martian's hood pointed at the batteries that were still firing across the river, and as it advanced, it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat ray. In another moment, it was on the bank and in a stride wading halfway across. The knees of its foremost legs bent at the further bank, and in another moment, it raised itself to full height again close to the village of Shepperton. Forthwith, the six guns, which unknown to anyone on the right bank, had been hidden behind the outskirts of that village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, the last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case generating the heat ray as the first shell burst six yards above the hood. 
I gave a cry of astonishment. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted upon the nearer incident. Simultaneously, two other shells burst in the air near the body of the hood, twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge, and the fourth shell. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, and whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. Hit! shouted I, and something between a scream and a cheer. I heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me. I could have leaped out of the water with that momentary exultation. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance by a miracle, and no longer was heeding its steps. With the camera that had fired the heat ray now rigidly upheld, it reeled swiftly upon Shipper Shepperton. The living intelligence, the Martian within the hood, was slain and splashed to the four winds of heaven with the thing that was now a mere intricate device of metal whirling to destruction. It drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepherd and Church, smashing it down, as the impact of a battering ram might have done, swerving aside, blundered on, and collapsed with a tremendous force into the river, out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a, a spout of water, steam, mud, and shattered metal shot far into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment, a huge wave, like a muddy tidal bore, but almost scaldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling shoreward, and I heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the seething roar of the Martian collapse. For a moment, I added nothing of... I heeded nothing of the heat, forgot the patent need of self-preservation. I splashed through the tumultuous water, pushing aside a man in black to do so until I could see round the bend. Half a dozen deserted boats pitched aimlessly upon the confusion of the waves. The fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river, and for the most part, submerged. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and the, through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see intermittently and vaguely the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms, and save for the helpless purposelessness of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing were struggling for its life amid the waves. Enormous quantities of ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. My attention was diverted from this death flurry by a furious yelling like that of a thing called a siren in our manufacturing towns. A man, knee-deep near the towering path, shouted inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey. The Shepperton guns spoke this time unavailingly. At that, I ducked at once under the water and, holding my breath until the movement was an agony, blundered painfully under a ahead under the surface as long as i could the water was in a tumult about me rapidly growing hotter when for a moment i raised my head to take a breath and throw the hair and water from my eyes the steam was rising in a whirling white fog at the first hid the martians altogether the noise was deafening then i saw them dimly colossal figures of gray magnified by the mist they had passed by me, and two were stooping over the frothing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. The third and fourth stood behind him in the water, one perhaps two hundred yards from me, and the other toward Lakeham. The generators of the heat rays were waved high, and the hissing beams smote down this way and that. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing, confusing conflict of noises, the clangorous din of the Martians, the crush of the falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds, flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to and fro over Weybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent white that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flames. The nearer houses still stood intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, faint, and pallid into the steam, with the fire behind them going to and fro. For a moment, perhaps, I stood there, breast high in an almost boiling water, dumbfounded at my position, hopeless of escape. Through the reek I could see people who had been with me in the river, scrambling out of the water and through the reeds like little frogs, hurrying through the grass in the advance of a man, or running to and fro under the utter dismay of the towing path. 
Then suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping toward me. The houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames and the trees charged a fire with a roar. The heat ray flickered up and down the tow towing path, licking off people who ran this way and that and came down to the water's edge not fifty yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel crested with steam. I turned shoreward. In another moment, the huge wave, while nigh at the boiling point, rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scalded, half-blinded, agonized. I staggered through the leaping, hissing water toward the shore. Had my foot stumbled, it would have been the end. I fell helplessly in the full sight of the Martians upon the broad, bare, gravelly split at that runs down the murk in the angle of Way and Thames. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down within a score of yards of my head, driving straight into the loose gravel, whirling this way and that, and shifting again. A long pause of suspense, and then the fork carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear, and then presently faint through a veil of smoke, receding intermittently, as it seemed to me across a vast space of river and meadow. And then, very slowly, I realized that by a miracle, I had escaped.